Hi, everyone. Um, happy holidays to you all. I'm so glad you're here. Um, it's not my week. It's what? Speak a little louder. A little louder? Okay. Um, we have Allison Rees here with us tonight. She is in the UK right now. She travels to Africa on safaris. She's going to tell us all about it. Um, she's done photography since she was eight years old. She loves nature and wildlife photography. And she was a camp manager in Africa with her husband. And then the pandemic hit. And um, she's been... Uh, volunteering at the Cheetah Con Conservation Fund in the UK, and she delivers photographic safaris to the Maasai Mara, I'm sure I slaughtered that. She shoots with a cannon, and um, we're so glad she's here with us. But before I turn it over to her, I want you to tell you about what's happening in January. In January, uh, Russ Barnabelt and James, James Zeman will introduce the 52 Frames Photo Challenge. Now, this is a website you can um, join, and it encourages people to, just to get out there and shoot. So every week, they have a different subject, and um, uh, Russ and James are going to share all their experiences and discuss how the challenge has improved their skills. And they say on their website, Frame Your World isn't just our tagline, carve out a slice of time each week to really look around you. You will start to see your world differently. Um, I mean, we are a phot photography project. Everyone has the same seven days for that challenge. The point is to press that shutter button each week and take that photo. Share with the world. Be okay with imperfection. Get helpful feedback from our community and give your thoughts on others. And repeat, don't break the chain. Let the consistency of cre creativity build each week after week and discover new creative breakthroughs you never knew you had. So kind of sounds like fun, doesn't it? Kind of makes one want to um, achieve something different, I think, every week. So um, with that, I'm going to turn everything over to Allison. And so, Allison, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Okay. Um, do we have a couple minutes at the end for questions? Definitely, yes. Plenty of time for questions. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, we're going to do some uh, change my microphone here. And I'm going to change my HD camera. Okay, so um, can you hear me, Allison? I can hear you, yeah. Okay, so um, we're ready for you to share your screen. Um, Randy, can you get the lights, please? Brilliant. Okay. Should you be able to see that okay? We can. Brilliant, thank you. So good evening, everyone, and happy holidays, and welcome to Living the African Dream. So for me, I fell in love with Africa when I was six, seven years of age. And I watched Born Free with George and Joy Adamson. And I'm sure a few of you have probably watched the same film. And I was amazed with the fact that they were raising this lion cub. And that's what I wanted. I wanted my own lion cub. But I was living in the southern part of the UK at the time. So it was a little bit difficult. In the end, um, my parents got me a tabby kitten, which kept me quiet for a while. But what's so special about Africa? For me, 
those wide open, endless plains that just go on forever. And I have a huge fascination for cheetahs. This is a single mother raising her family all by herself. They're the smallest of our big cats in Africa. There's less than 7,500 left in the wild now, so they are becoming endangered. But as a keen photographer, it's also those beautiful amber colored eyes. So before the pandemic, I was living and working in Africa for 16 years. Originally in Zambia, South Luangwa National Park, I was there for eight years. And that's actually where I met my husband who was working at another safari camp. And we got married out there and had a bush wedding. After eight years, we moved to Malawi and then to Tanzania. Sulu in the south and then onto the Serengeti. And for me, that was my dream, those wide open endless plains. And for the last three years, we were in Kenya in Mara North Conservancy. During the majority of this time as camp managers, running safari camps, but also involved with local community projects, and for me, conservation, especially with cheetahs out there. And then the pandemic hit the world and nobody was traveling any longer. And so I returned back to the UK where I, pretty much been most of my time. But I was also became a volunteer for the Cheetah Conservation Fund in the UK. So the equipment I use is Canon. I started off with a 50D and then progressed on with a 6D, 7D Mark II. And for the last few years, I've been using a 5D Mark IV. And then about five months ago, I also got a Canon R5. So the majority of the photos you will see this evening have been taken with the 5D. I use a 100 to 400 mil lens because I find it very versatile with wildlife photography. Um, on safari, the majority of the time, you haven't got enough space in a vehicle for a tripod. So I'm using either a bean bag or a gimbal or sometimes even handheld. I also have a 500mm f4 fixed lens and landscapes I use a 16 to 35mm. So this evening I'm going to start our journey in the Serengeti National Park. And the Serengeti is 14,750 square kilometers. The main area is Serenera, right in the middle. And we were actually based 45 minutes drive south from there. This is the camp we were based at. A lot of the camps are tented, just to give you a bit of an idea. There was 12 tents no fence, animals can come through at any time. It ran totally from solar power, looking right out across the open plains with a huge big rock formation behind it. Now, just walking around the camp, you got to see a lot of wildlife. And these I just took walking around the footpaths um, and just hand holding my camera. These are hyrax. They are the nearest relative to the elephants. They're about the size of a rabbit. And they like to live in amongst those rocky areas. And you could get fairly close to them on foot. Also around the rocks, Angama lizards. This is the male, very vibrant in color. And especially early morning, late afternoon, they'll sit on the rocks and they'll enjoy the warmth from the sunshine. So they don't tend to run 
round or run away from you too quickly. But with a 100 to 400 mil lens, you can capture some nice photographs. But we also had larger game coming around the camp as well, especially Cape buffaloes. The numbers could be anything from 20 up to four or 500 in numbers in a herd. And for me, the buffalo is one of the most dangerous animals in Africa. It's very unpredictable. Sometimes they'll stand and stare like this one. There'll be other times when they'll run away. But there will be the odd occasion when they will come straight towards you. So for guests, early mornings and evening times, you would always be escorted by one of our Maasai security. Now, in those rocky areas behind the camp, we quite often had lionesses up there, either walking around the rocky areas, but they would also use it to give birth to their cubs and keep them safe for the first couple of weeks. And then they would walk right down the front of the camp and come down to drink. This lioness just walked around the bottom of the camp in the late afternoon, we saw her walking round. So I got into a vehicle and I drove as near as I could, keeping a little bit of a distance from her, but I wanted the low angle. I was trying to capture her drinking and those beautiful eyes just looking at me. We also had lions coming through the camp at night time as well. And one particular evening, it was about eight o'clock at night, and I was walking from the main area along one of the pathways, past the guest tents, shining my torch as I walked by myself, actually looking out for buffalo, when suddenly in the torchlight, I saw a lion walking straight towards me. I stopped. I was shining my torch around to check if there were any other lions. And I think my heart was slightly racing at that time as well. I only saw the one lion that was on the same footpath as me. So very slowly, I started to walk backwards to a huge big rock. And I called on the radio to our security just to pre-warn them um, that there were lions in the camp and not to bring the guests into this area. I slowly walked back to the main area where my husband was like, what are you doing back so soon? And I said, well, there's a lion in the camp. And he was like, a lion? And I said, yes. So I showed him. And this lion had actually walked to one of the guest tents and just laid down there in front of it and fell asleep. Now, we had guests in each of the tents. but They were having dinner in our dining tent at the time. So I walked down and said, well, take your time with your dinner. Maybe have another glass of wine. Because um, your tent is occupied at the moment by a lion. And after about 15 or 20 minutes, the lion actually woke up again, gave a huge big stretch and yawn and just literally walked out through the other side of the camp. And I think he was literally having a cat nap before going out hunting for the night. Then right next to the camp, we had a spotted hyena den. And you will see, especially in the Serengeti and the Mara, a lot of hyena dens. Now, this one was literally right next to the camp. So as soon as you left the camp on a game drive, you would stop and you would see what's happening. And this particular morning, this hyena was coming back to the den with the leg of a zebra. Also at the den, you would quite often see the youngsters because they were too 
young to go out scavenging or hunting, they would stay there with their mother or babysitter. As a, as a guest, hyenas are fascinating. They really are um, a lot of behavior to sit and watch. But as a camp manager, they're, they're actually a problem because every single night you have to make sure everything is locked away. Otherwise, the next morning, you'll find your chairs, tables have been chewed on and literally cushions or anything scattered across the open plains. And then about a 20 minute drive away, we had a lake. For five to six months, every single year, the flamingos would come to feed. Now, early mornings and late afternoons is the best time for photography. This was taken at around 5.30 in the afternoon. You could actually drive right, right close to the edge of the lake and even get out of the vehicle and sit or lie on the ground. And this was taken with my 6D and my 500 mil lens. And I had a shutter speed of 1,200th of a second because I also was trying to capture them coming into land and taking off as well. And there were lots of other birds around as well, Cape Teal and black wing stilts, which like to spend hours just balanced on one leg. The Serengeti also has um, a good population of lions, around 3,000 lions there. And quite often you will see at least one with a collar on like this one. And that was so that the researchers could easily track their movements. And it was in the Serengeti that I realized lions climb trees. This is one pride of lions in one acacia tree, which was a very strong tree. This was uh, with my wide angle lens shooting up just to try and capture the, all the lions in the tree. Um, and lions there in the Serengeti climb for a few reasons. A, to get out of that heat of the midday sun. But also there are tsetse flies around in certain areas, so they can bite. The climbing the trees will get away from them. And then also after the long rains, the grass can be very tall. So again, by climbing up the tree, it gives them that height so they can look across the plains for prey. Now, the one amazing thing that happens every single year is the wildebeest migration. And if any of you have already been to the Serengeti or the Mara and you've witnessed this, you know, it is something amazing to see. They reckon each individual wildebeest will walk about 1,000 miles. It starts in late December in the southern part of the Serengeti. And then normally by late March, April, they start their journey all the way up through the Serengeti, up to the Mara. And then by October, they start the journey all the way back down again. It's now late December in the southern part of the Serengeti. All the females are pregnant. And then normally by early to mid-January, you start to get short rain showers. And so the wildebeest start to give birth. On average, about 500,000 wildebeest calves are born at this time. Now, they can be given birth any time of the day. They tend to do it early in the mornings, but this one in particular was at midday. And we sat and watched her for a good hour, hour and a half, just walking around, getting down, standing up, getting down 
moving around, very uncomfortable. And then suddenly, after about one and a half hours of doing this, she gave birth to this tiny calf. Um, it was, as I said, the heat of the day, so it was quite a heat haze. After five minutes of giving birth, this tiny little calf started to wobble and stand up. And within about 15 to 20 minutes, they were already walking to join the rest of the herd. The grass is really very nutritious down there. So the calves and their mothers will stay in this area for about three months, getting their strength up. But it's also a time for predators there. Lions, hyenas, jackals, cheetahs, they will all come in to benefit from the wildebeest migration. Cheetahs will come in from other areas. They will give birth to their cubs down there because they, will, they know that there's plenty of food around for them. And so by late March, early April, it's time for the wildebeest to start their journey. That long journey up through the Serengeti. By late June, it's very dry and dusty in the Serengeti. There's very little grass left. So for the herds, they must keep moving looking for food and water. Depending on the rain pattern, normally by mid-July, they, they have got to the Mara River and they begin to cross. Now for the wildebeest migration, you know, it can be a huge herd or it can be a small amount, but there are so many dangers for them. When you are there watching, it's an amazing experience. There are many different crossing points along the Mara River. You can be lucky and sit and wait for 30 minutes, or you could sit and watch for eight or 10 hours and still a crossing may not happen. All the vehicles have to stay back to start with until they start to cross the water. Once they're in the water, then the vehicles can move forward. And this is to ensure that the wildebeest do not get disturbed. If the vehicles are too close, the wildebeest will not cross. Some crossings last five, 10 minutes. Others can last up to two hours plus. Some of the areas for the wildebeest are Deep in water, they can also be very rocky in areas. There can be masses of them crossing at any one time. And huge crocodiles are waiting for them on the opposite side of the bank. Some just do not make it. Those banks at times are very steep and they can be very slippery. And especially when there are so many trying to cross, the old and the weak just get pushed back into the river and they drown. But vultures and crocodiles are there waiting for those. Those that make it into the Mara, there's lush green grass waiting for them. And so they stay there for about three months. Normally by mid October, the Mara gets short rains. And so for the wildebeest, that's their time to turn around and head all the way back through the Serengeti. Until late December, when they're back down in their carving area again in the south. As I say, it really is an amazing journey that happens every single year. Masai giraffe are very elegant. 
and also very tall. And when you see a group of them huddled together like this, all looking in one direction, it normally tells you that there is something around, a danger or a predator. Now, they were all, all of these giraffes were looking in one direction. And I couldn't see what they were looking at, hence my comment that they're very tall. Then after about 10 minutes or so, suddenly this male lion popped its head up. And that's what they'd been looking at the whole time. They had that advantage that they could see this male lion in the, tall gr in the grass. Wherever you travel in Africa, you're certainly going to come across elephants. Early mornings, they're coming out from the forest areas and they're starting to feed. By mid-morning, the youngsters start to have a little bit of a play fight. And in the heat of the day, they're enjoying a cool, refreshing dust bath. But with, whenever you're out on safari in a vehicle, it's great just to switch off the engine and just to sit there and let the elephants walk all around you. They're very inquisitive. Some of them will raise their trunks and they'll be sniffing you as they walk past. But you'll get to sense the size of them, but also how quietly they walk past you. And it gives you that opportunity to really get up close to them as well. You know, looking at the textures of the skin, but also their eye and the trunk. Another question I get asked a lot is, would I see a leopard on safari? Well, there certainly are a lot of leopards around, but they are very shy. You might just see one like this that was climbing down from a tree, or maybe all you'll see is just that little towel dangling. Or it might be sitting, looking out across the open plains. Or like this one that was sound asleep. And I came across this leopard in the afternoon. It was about 3.30 in the afternoon. I sat there for a good three hours, hoping it was going to wake up. And I kept changing different positions. It did wake up, finally. And in the distance, there were some impala. I was hoping it was going to start to climb down and begin to hunt. But unfortunately, it just went back to sleep again. And wildlife photography, you really do have to be very, very patient. Certain times of the year, the acacia trees come into flower and the baboons just love the flowers. The bird life in Africa is amazing. You've got over 680 species of birds and they're so colorful as well. These are yellow-billed oxpeckers on the back of a buffalo. And then taking flight, from buffalo to buffalo or maybe to a giraffe. And I must say that again, it was patience because these little birds do fly very quickly. And so there was a lot of panning going on. Um, shutter speed was two thousandths of a second. Normally I use aperture priority for the majority of my wildlife photography, but for birds, I will switch to shutter priority because just to make sure that you have enough fast shutter speed to be able to get that head and beak in focus. The lilac-breasted roller, probably one of the most photographed birds in Africa, with those lovely vibrant colors. And the little bee eater, 
This is one of my favorite birds to sit and watch and photograph. If you're parked up in a vehicle, you can just sit and watch these birds take flight and they'll come back to the same perch time and time again. You get that opportunity to just keep watching them coming and going. One of our bigger birds, this is the Marshall Eagle. And it had actually just caught a guinea fowl and taken it into a small bush. And down by the, the rivers and the ponds, you'll quite often come across hammercops. This one was actually in a pond and it kept flying around catching these very small fish. So we positioned up where the bird was literally coming across the pond after it had been fishing. And again, a fast shutter speed, I think it was about two thousandths of a second, and still the wing tips were blurred. And then after the rains, for the short rains or even the long rains, you certainly get a lot of babies that are born. These are hearty beasts. Zebra. Plenty of lion cubs. And warthogs, which are probably one of the hardest things to photograph, because whenever you pick up your camera, they certainly run away from you. And after the rains, there's plenty of lush grass for the huge herds of elephants with lots of babies of different ages. So I was in the Serengeti for three and a half years. And after that time, I got the opportunity with the same company to move to the Masai Mara. Now, the Serengeti is a national park, which means that there are strict um, rules and regulations. You can only do on-road driving, no off-road driving. If you see a lion in the very far distance, you have to hope that that lion comes towards you or you have a very long lens. Also, at times, it can be very busy. So there can be a lot of vehicles around that lion or that leopard, especially if it's close to the road. In the Mara, you've got the National Reserve, which has the same rules and regulations. But you also have these conservation areas. Now the Masai Mara ecosystem is only 3000 square kilometers. So it's much smaller in size. And I was actually based in Mara North Conservancy, which is a vibrant green. But during the last year, I've been doing safaris out in Old Kinye and also in uh, Motorogi here as well. Now, conservancies is land that is owned by the local Maasai. It's community land. And they lease it back to the, to the um, conservancy management. And it's much more flexible. There are less camps and lodges in those areas. So it's low impact tourism. There's less vehicles. So there's less vehicles around a sighting, but there's also the flexibility of going off road. You can drive up to 20 meters to an animal. You can also do um, day drives, night drives, and walking safaris there as well. So, plus the Maasai community are benefiting from tourism as well. So for me, it's a win-win. Tourism, the community and wildlife all benefiting from each other. Any of the conservancies in the Mara are about a 40, 45 minute flight from Nairobi. Again, most of them are tented. And they're all comfortable with ensuite. 
charging in your tents and Wi-Fi. But safaris start early in the morning. And the best time is to get out there whilst it's still dark. So normally you'll have tea and coffee in your tent and then departure can be about 5.30, 5.45 in the morning. Because you wanna be out there before the sunrise. This particular morning, I'd heard lions calling and I wanted to get out there and photograph them before the sunrise. But as you can see, I didn't find lions. I only found wildebeest in the end. However much I tried to find where the lions were, they were well hidden. And just as that lovely yellow sky starts to come up, these two wildebeest started to walk along the horizon. So I positioned the vehicle just at a low angle. I actually got out of the vehicle and, and was lying low and captured these wildebeest on the horizon. Again, early morning light on this lioness, just as she's walking towards us. This was about 6.30, 6.45 in the morning. And you take your breakfast out with you. There's no point rushing back to the camp. You have your hamper breakfast out whenever it suits you. And then you carry on with your safari until lunchtime. You get back to the camp for lunch, have a bit of a downtime, rest, charge your camera batteries. And then normally by four o'clock, you're back out on another drive. And then just before the sun sets, you're finding a nice location. If there's no predators around, you can get out of the vehicle. And again, you can lie low to get that angle of the animals and the sun. And this was two of the Maasai that were walking across the plains. And I just asked them if we could um, take photos of them with the sunlight. And then normally you will return back to camp just as it's getting dark. Enjoy a drink around the campfire. And on those beautiful clear nights, you're looking at the stars, the Milky Way and the Southern Cross. The Mara Conservancies are very good for lions. And when I was there this year, I was actually surprised at how well the lion prides are doing. They are huge in numbers now. On average, 20, 25 plus lions to a pride. This was the camp where we were based in the Mara. And this pride of lions quite often came around the camp. And these two mothers, one particular day, actually hid these tiny little cubs that are three months of age, they hid them overnight in these bushes whilst they went out hunting. A couple of the male pride, beautiful big manes with the males in the Serengeti and the Mara. And this was the pride around the camp. So there was two males, four females, and then they had cubs of various ages. And the lions are very used to the vehicles. They will literally walk around the vehicle as well. Providing you're sitting in the vehicle and you're not leaning out, they will take no notice of you whatsoever. And, you know, if there are cubs in the prides, they are more active. Lions will sleep 16 to 18 hours a day. So they'll be active early in the morning. By 7.30 in the morning, they'll be in the shade and they'll already be sleeping. And quite often, you'll then wait until a good 6, 6.30 before they get active again. But with cubs, you certainly get to see a lot more action going on. 
And this particular late afternoon, it was about 6.30 in the evening, this lioness suddenly came out of the bushes, moving one of her cubs. This was with ISO of 8,000 with a 100 to 400 mil lens. And it was struggling with the light at this stage. And quite often you'll see a little bit of conflict going on with the males and females, um, also mating as well. This male was trying to mate with this female, but she was not interested at all. And buffalo actually show a lot of aggression to lions. This buffalo had chased this lioness up into that tree and just stood, stood there and didn't let this lioness back down again. So I'm now going to introduce you to Amani, who is a cheetah that I got to know well in the Mara. In April 2018, she gave birth to three cubs. And a cheetah mum will keep her cubs very well hidden for the first four weeks. At five weeks of age, she brought them out into the open. And this particular afternoon, she was walking across the plains when suddenly a hyena spotted her and head, was heading straight towards her and the cubs. Now, normally we do not intervene with nature, but because they are so endangered cheetahs, the rangers actually drove their vehicle close by and they blocked the sight of the cheetah to the hyena. The hyena couldn't see the cheetah any longer. And the hyena just got bored and walked away. So for Amani and her cubs, it was a very lucky afternoon. The cubs are now six months of age. They're growing very quickly. Cheetahs are active during the day. They will hunt during the day and they'll be playing during the day. Um, the, at six months of age, these cubs are now stalking each other. They're pouncing on each other. And they'll watch their mother when she goes to hunt. And of course, they will share anything that she catches with them. She's just taken down a young impala here. They're now 10 months of age. So they're nearly as big as their mother in the middle, and they can take small prey for themselves. Their brother, one of the cubs, has just taken down a scrub hare. And then at 18 months of age, they became independent. Their mother literally just walked away. And normally the mother is already pregnant by now. For me, I was very lucky and privileged to get to watch these cubs grow from four weeks of age up to 18 months. And whenever I saw them, I would photograph them and I would share that information with the cheetah researchers in the Mara. And so they asked me to name them. Two females are called Queerly, which means true, and Kuleta, to bring. And their brother is Jasiri, which means bold. And as I mentioned, you know, these conservancies are Maasai land. So when you're out doing a game drive, you will come across the Maasai with their goats and sheep and cattle. And quite often they're happy for you to photograph them as they're walking around. It makes quite nice landscape photography. You can also go to a village um, to actually see their home. And this I took with my wide angle, but I was kneeling down to take this photograph. The Maasai are very proud people. So they want to share their culture with you. This is how they used to hunt with bow and arrow. And how do you make a fire without a box of matches? 
by rubbing two sticks of wood together, dried grass and elephant dung. The chief of the village, who had six wives and 35 children, and he told me he couldn't remember most of their names. The women build the houses. It takes four weeks to build a house from a, a wooden structure and then um, cow dung and mud smeared inside and out, which dries hard like a cement. There's no running water. Every single day, the women need to walk down to the river to collect water. And if they're lucky like these ladies, they will have donkeys to help them. But most have to carry it by themselves. There's no electricity. Slowly, you see these small solar panels, and that's for actually mainly for charging a mobile phone. The women will be at the village doing their beadwork, which they sell at the local markets. And if you do visit them, they are so happy to have their photo taken. They love to see the back of your digital cameras or your phones and see the photographs that you've taken. I'm just going to finish this evening with just a few more wildlife photos. So normally, um, as I mentioned, you've got the short rains in October time, and then you've got the long rains in April and May. And that build up of the rains gives these very dramatic skies, and it gives very isolated showers. So in the distance was this one isolated shower, with this one wildebeest just walking across the horizon. And this was taken at 400 mil lens. Also, January, February time, especially in the Mara, you get very misty mornings, which gives a lot of atmosphere to your photos. But for any of the predators, it's very, very hard for them to go hunting. And this was a family of jackals that I sat and watched for about one, one and a half hours. And it's the one thing I say to anybody that goes on safari, it's not about going out, check, having a checklist and just quickly going from A to B. Try to just sit and watch and observe because you will get so much more from what you see, also so much more from your photography. And this family were literally running around the bushes. They came to this termite mound and they were running up and down it, and then they were running in and out of it. And I was waiting for one of them to come jumping out, climbing out of the hole. Masai giraffe across the plains. Or maybe taking a drink. This is from Salu, wild dogs. And it's probably one of the best places that I've actually ever seen wild dogs. In one day, I saw four different packs. Elephants enjoying a mud bath. And then you've got the beautiful reflections as well, especially early mornings and late afternoons. And the beauty of that leopard, those color of those gray eyes. And so for me, this really does sum up Africa. Study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. And this one elephant was actually in Old Pajeta Conservancy. And by around 4.30, it was busy feeding and it was very short grass because they've had a huge drought problem up there. And then 
just as the sun was starting to set, he went up onto the horizon. And I was literally lying flat on the grass, taken with a 400 mil lens. So there was some distance there. But out of the, above the clouds, that sky, that lovely sunlight just peeped through as the sun started to set. So thank you for joining me this evening. And I'm very, going to be very happy to answer any questions that you have. But if anybody is interested, I do run safari trips now um, into the Mara and other areas in Kenya. And you can find information on my website or email me. Or if any of you are traveling to Africa and you just want some information, please feel free to ask me or send me um, any of your questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Or if you want to join uh, my Facebook page and, and see some of the photos that I take. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, I'm going to switch the microphone back to the um, to the other camera and point it towards the group to see if um, anyone has questions. No problem. Is there anybody here who has a has a question for Allison? Oops. Anyone have a question? Yeah, doesn't she worry about uh, like when the line was coming toward her, she was still photographing it. I would have been. Were you worried when the lion was coming towards you while you were photographing it? Um, I was just on foot and it was in the dark, to be honest. So I, when it was walking towards me, yes, the, the heart did beat, race a little bit. And I did move back, you know, to a safer area. So I was using, I was behind sort of a, a big rock boulder as protection. And lions, you know, they don't really want to attack us. If I was starting to run, then yes, you know, you would see that that lion had changed its behavior. Um, but they don't really show any interest in us. So they don't really want that conflict with us. Not seeing this is this is not working. Um, I I have one question: Is when would you say is the best time of year to come? Um, totally depends which country. If you're talking East Africa, then I like January February time. Short grass, especially in the conservancies. But if you want to go for the migration then you're looking at August, September time. You know, it's hard to say with the wildebeest migration and July, August can be very, very busy with people. Mm. If you want it when it's not so busy, then I would say late September, early October and January and February. Okay. Anybody else have a question? No? Great photography. Wonderful photographer. Yes. And, we, and, and we want to thank you for staying up so late. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Night for her. So <laughs> I'm going to go back to the computer here. So. All right. Um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask them. Yeah. Really. All right. Well, if there are no other questions, again, thank you so much. Um, your, your photography was beautiful and um, very inspiring. And um, if you want to come to Africa, Safari is definitely on my bucket list. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? No? If anybody thinks of any later, they can definitely drop me an email. I'm always happy to answer, so no problem. All right. Thank you so very much, and you have a wonderful holiday. 
and um, maybe the next week <laughs> for the rest of the weather in the <laughs> Thank you. I'm wishing everybody there a very happy holiday as well. Enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.